curious to know where are these where are all of these wonderful faces from? Do they call yes. this home? Jeffrey Remark, you want to say hi, where you're from, who you're interning with? I caught you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm from South Park, PA, just a little bit outside of Pittsburgh, and uh, I'm actually intern interning with Pittsburgh Golf now. Awesome. Welcome. Glad to have you. Justin Chen, how about you? Where are you from? Are you interning? Are you just job hunting? What brought you to the Passport? Uh, the latter. Um, I'm just uh, exploring, basically. Um, I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Awesome. Welcome. So, Glad yeah. to have you. Chloe Myers, how about you? Um, I'm from like Butler, it's a little north of Pittsburgh, and I'm interning with Highmark Health this summer. Awesome, welcome. Jake, I hope you're not actually driving right now, you're just in the car as you're jumping onto this. <laughs> Where are you from? Oh, you're muted. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, so I'm from uh, Monroeville, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm currently unemployed due to COVID-19. I'm a chef uh, in the industry, but um, I got the uh, invitation through CCAC, so I thought I'd jump on and see what's going on. So I signed up for a bunch of the uh, passports throughout the summer. Awesome. I hope you'll join us for some of our cooking series, too. We could use some more culinary people <laughs> cooking along with us. Allison, if I may, Jake, what kind of cooking? What kind of... Uh... Uh, I do everything right now. I'm actually a chef. Uh, uh, I do like consultant work. So if uh, a restaurant's having trouble or struggling, um, getting their name on the map, um, I, I, you know, that's what I do. I put them on the map. Um, you may have heard of Fly Fox Brewing Company. Yes. So they opened up a tap house in Pittsburgh and I was responsible for that project. Um, we're right at the Riverview apartment complex at the, it's like the 300 block of Pittsburgh, right at the water, the, uh, I guess you call that the, uh, where the fountain is, the point. So that's one of my works that you may, guys, you may be familiar with. Abigail Kavanaugh, how about you? Where are you from? Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm from Butler, PA. Um, I go to Slippery Rock University for criminology and psychology. Great. Welcome. How about Melanie Ariola? Hi, everyone. My name is Melanie. I'm currently an intern for the city of Pittsburgh, and I just graduated from Chatham University, but I'm originally from Los Angeles. Awesome, glad to have you in Pittsburgh. We hope to keep you here. So thanks everyone for, for jumping in and appreciate you guys being on video and being present here with us. It's lovely to see faces and, and actually get to interact with everyone. Um, so feel free as people are jumping on to continue uh, putting comments and questions into the chat function. We'll have a Q&A session at the end but we have a lot of great information to share, so I, I'd like to get started. Uh, thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. I'm really excited to be here with a powerhouse panel of women to talk about the importance of civic engagement and leadership and how you can work to make an impact in 2020. So first I'd like to introduce Aradna Oliphant, the President and CEO of Leadership Pittsburgh, and also one of the warmest, most wonderful people you will ever meet. So uh, Aradna, thank you again for leading our discussion today. Thank you, Alison. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks to the Allegheny Conference for putting together the Passport series and wanting to continue it despite all the challenges that we are facing. Uh, and it was nice to meet your intern extraordinaire, Dustin, for the first time. So hello, everyone. Um, when Allison asked if I'd be uh, around, I said, yeah, sure, where am I going? <laughs> I'm in Pittsburgh, no travel, no conference, no nowhere else, so here I am. Uh, my name is Aradna Malhotra Oliphant, and uh, I'm an immigrant to not only Pittsburgh, but to the country. I came here, but this is home, the United States is home, Pittsburgh is home. I came here kicking and screaming uh, about, gosh, 
20 years ago. And now when I travel, when, and I will travel in the future outside the country, um, uh, people ask me if I work for the mayor's office. That's how passionate I am about Pittsburgh. And I certainly hope that uh, all of you have that sense already, whether you're from the region, if you're from Monroeville, you're from Pittsburgh. If you're from Slippery Rock, you're from Pittsburgh. It's the Steeler Nation, right? And uh, so, so, so happy to meet all of you. And Allison uh, talked about the composition. And of course, I was going to be there. Um, so uh, these are, I'll be introducing you to three of my fellow uh, co-panelists. I'll tell you a little bit about what Le Leadership Pittsburgh does. Uh, and yay to the Chatham alumna. I also serve on the Chatham University Board of Directors. So hopefully you had a great experience uh, and that you will stay here in Pittsburgh. The, um, we are in uh, that word unprecedented is like, so overused it feels, but it is so true. Um, these are really very interesting times, as you all know, not just the pandemic, but some of the old truths about racism have been so powerfully revealed yet again. And so we are as business leaders, nonprofit leaders, government leaders, we are all facing what uh, the military actually coined many, many, many years ago as a VUCA environment. I don't know if any of you have heard about the VUCA environment, not say yes, no, maybe, no. Okay, so I'll not go into the details of it, but, uh, but you know, Google VUCA. VUCA basically stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And if you look at what the circumstances are that you all are stepping into, it has characteristics of everything. So, so, so it's scary, but it's also exciting, right? Because anything can happen and new skills are being required. People are adapting, people are giving their employees more flexibility and so on and so forth. Anti-racism has become thankfully top of the line of uh, issues that we all have to combat. And there seems to be some sustain, sustained action behind it. Every meeting I have had in the past two, three weeks, that topic has come up and not only as a discussion topic, but what are companies doing about it? What are boards doing about it? What are organizations doing about it? So um, you're entering into a very wonderful, uh, exciting, somewhat scary, but if it was all stable, you wouldn't you know, that doesn't call for leadership, right? Uh, anyone can uh, anyone can charter a ship or, or captain a ship when the waters are calm. The calm. They're not calm waters, they need they need leadership. So uh, Alison asked me to say a little bit about Leadership Pittsburgh. We are a nonprofit organization. We connect civic leaders with civic issues. If Alison wants, she can throw up a few of the slides and I can uh, talk through them. So think of us as a very mini university and same kind of a business model, extremely mini. And our charter is to identify, connect and inspire leaders by equipping them with knowledge of the community so that they can be better leaders for the wider community. That's why we are a nonprofit. So we are not, we don't provide MBA kinds of training and something like that. It's all about the whole community. If you could flip to the next slide, please, Alison. Um, we have a variety of different programs and I can uh, maybe add a few more bullets. And yes, if you want to check us out, it's www.lpn.org or you can follow us at leadership PGH. Um, the the idea here is that it's a very strengths based organization so we we think that people we know we that people have strengths and our charter is how do we collect connect those strengths to the opportunities that the region has so that's what we do through leadership pittsburgh leadership development initiative which is our program for emerging leaders as you stay in the region and i'm sure you'll be if, if you're taking the initiative to be a part of the of the passport program the chances are you're a go-getter chances are that the companies and organizations that you will would be lucky to hire you would see you as a star and then we hope that you'll stay with those companies 
for three, four, five, six years, and then you'll apply to Leadership Development Initiative, which is our program for the hotshot young emerging talent from all companies and organizations. We do guest board placement and so on and so forth. Uh, um, uh, if you could go to the next slide, Allison, the kinds of companies and organizations that we work with are listed here. Uh, and I can tell you more about our organization um, in the Q&A, if you're interested, like how do you apply, who gets admitted, or you can just check it on our website. I don't want to suck up the time, but you can see for our senior program, we've had the CFO of CMU, the um, chairman of the environment in Pennsylvania, the uh, executive director for allies for children, VP of Comcast and so on and so forth. That is our senior leaders program, Omar from, who's the chief information security officer at IMARC. And for our emerging leaders program, uh, Josh, who well, used to be actually at the Allegheny Conference and now works at the Fourth Economy, Reed Smith Associate and so on and so forth. So um, I think those were my slides, right, Allison? Here's where, oh yeah, and our, Thank you, Allison. So what do we do at Leadership Pittsburgh? We consider that region is our classroom and because we are uh, developing and training leaders to help that region. So we expose them to both the opportunities in the region and the challenges in the region. Again, challenges are the one that require leadership. Uh, that's the kind of work we do. And if you have questions for me later on, um, uh, I'd be happy to answer them, but let's, let's, uh, Alison, does it make sense to, in essence of time, let's introduce the rest of the panelists. Is that good for you? Okay. Panelists, are you ready? And if, uh, why, I'll go with, so we have three panelists for you and the, the, what you're getting is just a sense of the power of the civic or nonprofit sector in our region. The uh, a study, which is a little bit outdated now, says that the, found that the nonprofit sector and not including the big uh, universities and the health systems actually is responsible for nearly 20 billion, yes, B, billion of gross regional product. Uh, there are in the city of Pittsburgh, it's about 20 to 25% of the uh, employment is nonprofits, and that might include governmental sector too. And in the county, it's about 15%. So imagine the economic impact of the sector. And we tend to hear only about big businesses, but there are lots of wonderful opportunities at uh, at nonprofit organizations. And the three who are, whom the Allegheny Conference, which is itself a nonprofit, has invited on the panel are some of the stars. But there are over 2,000 such organizations in, in the region. So uh, the stars that uh, we have today are um, Angela Garcia. And I'd let ask her to uh, share uh, a little bit about what Global Links does. And uh, then we'll go to, I think, uh, Sloan after that. Am I right, Allison? Sloan Davidson from Hello Neighbor. She's the founder of another fantastic organization. And then we will go to Gina Johnson, who's a wonderful leader over at an organization with a fantastic mission. Uh, and it's called Sustainable Pittsburgh. So, um, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Correct, Allison? So we will speed through and if my co-panelists would permit me to interrupt them in the essence of time, I will not be disrespecting, but I know how passionate you are about your own mission. So Angela, if you would tell us a little bit about what you do and um, what do you look for as you are hiring? Sure, I'll, I'll start with just a brief introduction since Global Links is an uh, unusual organization um, out there. We were founded here in Pittsburgh. I myself am a boomerang. So I left when I was 17, uh, traveled, uh, lived in about uh, six different countries and came back to Pittsburgh temporarily in 2000, uh, but found Global Links. And here I am 20 years later as executive director. Um, it's something we're very passionate about, but Global Links was founded to work with the healthcare sector. So that means uh, our hospitals in the mid-Atlantic, but also all of us are consumers of the healthcare sector. And we, what we do is we work with them to capture still useful materials. So uh, surplus materials that are unused, as well as items 
that all of us are more familiar with, maybe crutches, wheelchairs, breathing machines. Uh, what do you do with them when you're done, right? You sprained your ankle, et cetera. Our team works um, to the tune of about 300 tons of surplus captured every year. And if you go to the next slide, Allison, and when that comes into our headquarters, we're located in Green Tree, right outside downtown. Um, we engage with over 3,000 volunteers from the community. Um, on any given day, pre-COVID, we would have volunteers from about 40 to 50 local corporations. So many corporate groups come in for team building um, and hands-on service. We work with students, the universities, um, local faith-based organizations, um, civic organizations, retirees. We have family volunteer days because our model was built that our community helps us convert this surplus into life-saving and life-improving donations. And all of these materials are used to improve health for vulnerable communities. So we work with the World Health Organization uh, for international programs, primarily in Latin America and the Caribbean. But we also work here in Western Pennsylvania to support the nonprofit community. And since COVID occurred, uh, if you would go to the next slide, Allison, we really had to step back and say, uh, how are we going to respond to COVID and the impact that we know is coming? We have a very unique skill set in our nonprofit. We do logistics, inventory management, we have IT systems to do so. so we have public health specialists because all of our programs are built on a public health model. Um, which is was not a common term pre-COVID. I'm happy to say that one of the things that people do understand a little bit better is public health now. But we're also disaster responders and recovery specialists. So we knew that early on the supply chain was going to break and that our organization and our team was in a position to support our nonprofit sector and provide them with PPE, emergency supplies, and other materials that their staff, their residents, or their clients could need. And I'm really proud of our team. Um, based on that diverse skill set, we do tap into um, several different university programs, which I'll get into and answer your question, Arad, in, in a moment. Um, but what we did was reach out and continue building partnerships, because who would need uh, assistance with PPE at the very beginning and would be challenged to do so were the shelters, so the domestic violence shelters, the homeless shelters, the free and charitable clinics, um, senior care facilities and child care facilities, which that photo on the right is one of my favorite we've gotten so far. Why? Because all of those are also nonprofits, have very limited budgets. Their business models were being impacted by having less clients or um, income based on their model. So we went from 31 partner organizations in Western Pennsylvania to as of this morning, our program manager told us we're up to 241 partner organizations, which really do range um, from the Community Relations Department of the Police. And I know there's lots of, of weight in that term right now, but the Community Relations team started with us when the mask initiative, when the mask mandate went into place, their Community Relations Officer is definitely a candidate for Leadership Pittsburgh in the future because she thinks outside the box. She, um, she helped us get to a lot of the, the community organizations that we weren't necessarily a 501c3, weren't a nonprofit. And we got out to this, to date, over, I think 350,000 masks in addition to disinfectant for the childcare facilities. We're providing them with thermometers. Um, as well as we're doing a diaper distribution to support the community. Why? We understand there's a lot of unmet needs and it really takes a diverse skill set. So what do, we look like, what do we look for in terms of engaging um, people for our staff? If you could go to the next slide, Allison. Is based on what, actually, if you go one more, and I'm going to come back to that one. Thank you. So we have all different ways of engaging. Um, whether people are in college currently, in high school, with their family, on a normal day, and we hope in August or September, our volunteer 
center is able to reopen, um, we welcome people to do a two hour volunteer day shift with us. Or if they're a corporate uh, organization, want to do a half day or full day, Stacy, our community engagement manager who's on the call is happy to work with anyone in that regard. We also do though is we have a young leaders advisory committee. So if you'd go backwards, Allison, I do apologize. Our Young Leaders Advisory Committee was formed as a committee of our board. They are advisors, so they don't have the fiduciary responsibility, but they come from really all sectors. And we want that diverse knowledge base, and we want young professionals who may not be able to dedicate their career to nonprofit, but want to get involved in sort of a training ground for future board membership. And they have been really instrumental in bringing diverse perspectives. And those who volunteer or join our advisory committee are oftentimes some of the first people that we look at when we do have job openings. We look at anyone who has volunteered regardless of what business sector they're working in. If they have a history of volunteering, that's a good indication they're a good fit for the nonprofit world. If they have any type of uh, service with us directly, since we are a very, um, we're a combination of environmental, public health, and humanitarian aid. If they've taken time to do a virtual tour with us, one of the other ways people get, get engaged, uh, visit us, know us, volunteer with us, that's already one up on what we're looking for in terms of their resume. So it takes that resume a step beyond. So besides the skills, it's also how people are involved in the community that is really something we look at when we're looking at job applicants. So Angela, um, that's how you look at, but if, if I, you know, you have had such a wonderful career, ha have you ever served on a board? Did that ever help you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I say I do serve now on two different advisory boards um, and it was really um, taking over for a founder just two years ago without getting into too much detail. There's work with our programs and our operations and doing all that I just described and leading our team, but there's also working with our own board. So I'm now the liaison between what we do and our board leadership. So. I serve on the advisory board for the Bayer Center for Nonprofit Management, as well as uh, the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. And um, those are both very dear to my heart because I am passionate about the nonprofit sector and I am passionate about um, being an ally. And the one I am most close to is the Latino community. Um, so working through issues at a very high level, not the day-to-day, because -day, I came from an operation, I grew up in the nonprofit sector, whereas at a board level, really talking about our strategy and our future, and that's really helped me to guide our young leaders advisory, which is newer, and helping them learn good governance. It's not just about bringing our friends together. We, in fact, when I was hired, I told our board, I don't want any more of the founders' friends joining. I want really a diverse skill set. We want people to challenge us so we, that we are continually growing as an organization. And that was before we knew COVID was gonna throw us into really a totally different way of running our, not a totally different running of our organization, a totally different way of thinking how we could scale. We didn't realize we were going to be scaling to the tune of 30 partners to 240 while still running our international programs as we're able based on border, border openings and closings. And I think really being open to diverse perspectives and getting challenged. And I, I tell our staff the same thing, both staff and board, please challenge. If I'm not getting pushback, if I'm not getting people questioning why we're doing things, you know, that's, that's dangerous to me because we need, particularly I think everybody's aware now, we need to be challenged daily. I grew up with a perspective. I married into another perspective. I have two teenagers now that challenge me on everything, but we all need that. And we have to be comfortable with that. And some days being uncomfortable, whether it's my board members or our staff or my fellow advisory board members, I think that's what, what we all need to be doing and just put ourselves out there in new environments. And so, you know, they say that you don't grow without discomfort. Uh, Allison did ask me to weave in leadership here because I'm supposed to be, you know, I need, I'm supposed to know a little bit about leadership. <laughs> um, and it's that discomfort in the boardroom, whether you are the executive director or the CEO of a company or, or the discomfort of not knowing everything quite mm -hmm. yet when you have joined a new board that helps you grow as a leader 
and of course it helps the perspective and uh, but then on a very uh, <laughs> a very practical way especially for the audience of Allison and Dustin's uh, group here is the networking that happens unbelievably unbelievably important, <laughs> important for finding a job finding an internship find and knowing that when you're serving on a board or a committee everyone is watching you mm -hmm. and, and something may come up in two years or ten years or two months but that just an in and of itself. So I would encourage everyone to take on that opportunity if you get it, sometimes even just virtually right now. Uh, talking of volunteers, um, Sloan, uh, my goodness, you have founded this tremendous organization that was what, on CNN or something very recently? And, and you, form, you moved from New York to Pittsburgh? or back to Pittsburgh and founded this organization. Tell us a little bit about that and also about in this virtual environment, how, how have you pivoted with uh, using volunteers? And if any one of the people, wonderful people at the Passports program want to sign up, how might they? Absolutely, thank you so much, Radna. Thank you, Alice, for putting this together for all the incredible co-panelists and all of you joining today. It's great to get to meet you all virtually. Um, I'm a born and raised proud Pittsburgher. I did move away for quite a number of years and always had a plan to come back. Um, I ended up moving back just shy of five years ago when I was six months pregnant with my first son. And I really wanted to get involved. Um, I've always been involved in nonprofits, either as a nonprofiteer myself, um, making donations as a volunteer, as a board member. And so coming back, I knew that would be a core part of like my building a community here, but I'd also done a lot of international development work. I've done projects in over eight countries, anywhere from a week to seven months. And so I really wanted to incorporate, you know, some of that international piece. And I um, didn't know how that would come alive in Pittsburgh because growing up here, I don't know that I had that exposure to a lot of international communities. And so I moved back and I also realized that I had spent so much time thinking about the rest of the world. And I really made a very intentional choice to focus this next chapter in Pittsburgh on hyperlocal, where I think so much change can happen um, in your community across the board, right? And so I was like, okay, what can I do locally with international communities and really set off on this journey to become as educated as I could about immigrants and refugees and the landscape. I got a mid-career master at Gispia. I saw a few of the chats in there that some of you are at Gispia, hello. Um, I started volunteering and then working part time at one of the refugee resettlement agencies that has since closed down. One of my best pieces of advice always, if there's something you're interested in, um, you can ask a lot of questions, you know, you can reach out to somebody, but volunteer or spend time there. So, you know, I sort of soaked up as much information as I could, giving as much as I could back. And then I ended up becoming patient zero. So I have a friend in a Syrian family. And I'm sorry to interrupt Sloan. If everyone other than the speaker could mute themselves, there's some noise. Yeah, and some of it might be my really loud children that are like pulling a dining room chair. <laughs> Hear it, right? uh, it, it, Sloan, it probably is, and that's what children are supposed to do as long as they're not breaking something. You're we're on the, they're not knocking on my door, and it's the precipice of nap time, so just bear with me. Oh, uh, that's good, that's good. That, that's bear that's me. the reality of life. Yeah. <laughs> this is the like lunch, you know, the, the energy burst right before the crash. It will be over soon. Um, so anyway, so yeah, there was a Syrian family that lived in my neighborhood and I ended up inviting them to Thanksgiving dinner. It was a crazy, interesting, fascinating story. I ended up writing on Medium that like went viral. If any of you have ever experienced virality and like a post, it's the wildest thing to just see it like spread and like hundreds of thousands of people be like, oh, I want to do this. So I was like, wow, this is so incredible. There must be something like this. That's what I kept saying because I didn't want to start it. I was like, that sounds so hard. 
to be the founder of a nonprofit. Like who would want, who would want to do that? So I, I was going around to faith leaders, to refugees, to interpreters, and to foundations. And I was like, this must exist. You know, you see everything. I'm from here, but I haven't been here in years. So tell me who's doing this. And it's like big brothers, big sisters, but for refugees. And you're working post resettlement. So they get initial support in the first 90 days. And then you like come in after and you're providing support as a friend, an ally, an advocate, a supporter. And time and time again, people were like, this doesn't exist. It's such a great idea. You should do it. And I think enough people said that, that, that one day I was like, maybe I should do it. Um, but one of those conversations was with the Heinz Endowments and they were really intrigued by this idea so that they were willing um, after some conversations to, for me to put together a proposal for them to help fund the pilot there was another group out of New York, UNHCR, which really runs refugee issues for the war, for the globe, and they were really interested in this piece of um, a, of mentorship for refugees. And so I graduated Gisby on Thursday, I started Hello Neighbor on Friday. That was in 2017. Since then, we've matched 122 families from 13 countries of origin with caring Pittsburghers to guide and support them in their new lives. Mentorship is and will always be our anchor program. But last year, we expanded to include a food social enterprise where we pay women 75 cents on the dollar for baked goods that we sell throughout the community on hold because of COVID. So rein in your love of baklava. I will try to get that back up as soon as possible. Um, we also have a Smart Start program focused just on our refugee mothers that are either expecting or are new moms. The challenges of becoming a new mom are so hard and to add on language and lack of culture. We just really found a big need there. And um, then we have a national network. So I've created a national coalition. Right now it's eight like-minded nonprofits all around the country who are doing work similar to Hello Neighbor. Um, to transition to COVID and to just sort of share. So, you know, we immediately moved to remote mentoring. There's that part of it. But then we realized there was so much need to help the refugee families that are here. They've already been through so much trauma. They're now navigating this new trauma and like, what does that look like? And so we launched what we call the Refugee Assistance Fund. That's a direct cash assistance program. We were able to turn around and raise $25,000 in a week. We've now raised just shy of 75,000. We give $250 cash to each family. Um, trusting them to use it as they best see fit in one of five core areas, rent, utilities, education, which could be, you know, Chromebook utilities, baby needs, um, and food. We also created new partnerships that we had never had before, um, really because of COVID and direct services. And so I always said, you know, we're not about stuff. We're about relationships. There's other great, fabulous organizations that help get you those needs. But what we found with the refugees is they'll open their doors for us. We've built this for them. And so a lot of them maybe have never used a food bank or a food pantry, not because they didn't even know it existed. It wasn't in their country. Maybe it was a pride issue. There's a lot of barriers. So we created partnerships with 412 Food Rescue, with the food bank. We expanded one with SHIM. We expanded one with the mosques. And um, we would help families go for the first time and then see what it's like in the hopes that they will then go on their own and we're helping with those steps to do that. So we really see us as navigators of systems. We've also done that with diapers and a lot of baby essentials, which I know um, was already mentioned, but that's so critical. Um, if, you're, if your income has gone down and you're now focused on hard costs, that's like rent, utilities, insurance, like you have to look at ways to, to, to save. And so we have a Beverly's uh, Beverly's Birthdays Partnership that's new. We put out wish lists that sold out in like six hours. You would have thought I was putting on a Lady Gaga concert. It was wild. Um, where we just like asked for a ton of baby supplies, sent out a note, and they were gone. And that's really been the core of Hello Neighbors community. We ask and people help support us. I have mask makers. We've given out masks to frontline workers and essential workers. Everything we ask for, people are just so inclined to help support us. I think it's in part because we do a really great job, I'd like to say, of storytelling. Um, one of our, our 
core values is a refugee first mindset. Another of our core values is dignified storytelling. And so we're always trying to tell compelling stories from the refugee perspective to let people understand what it's like to have those new neighbors and really aspiring Americans here. Just to shift into the last part of how people can get involved in the volunteer piece. So we sort of have a couple of things. We have, um, you know, vetted volunteers who are our mentors. That means security clearances. That means training. We typically don't have college students or grad students, but um, it's not to say that we couldn't, but we do have individuals, couples, young families, about 60% of our mentors are actually families. And then we have empty nesters and retirees. So we're multi-generational, multicultural. Um, we have other volunteer opportunities, especially right now with our, we have weekly distributions going on. So last week we did a distribution for food bank boxes and the diaper kits and all those things I talked about. We always need help organizing all of those things and then getting them into the hands of of the refugee families. We have meal trains for new babies. Um, and we're really always sort of navigating how best we can spend time and best serve the refugees to help them ultimately be more comfortable and confident in their new lives here. Um, 100% of our refugee families have kids under the 18, age of 18 at home and about, oh, last count, I want to say it's like 70, 50, 50 to 65% of those are under the age of 18. Um, we just had like eight new babies born, so probably excuse my percentage. But there's a lot of little kids. That's a lot of talent for Pittsburgh to hopefully be able to retain over time. And so I think a lot about these little kids, the experience that they're getting, the education they're getting, the support. Um, we have a lot of mentors who a kid will be like under five and they'll say, I'm gonna be there at high school graduation. I'm gonna be there at their wedding. I'm gonna be there. And I think that that's something that's, you know, that's really special about what we're doing. So there's a lot of different ways to get involved. We have a YP, we have um, a young professionals group. You know, we usually have a lot more friend and fundraising and community events those are all on hold because of COVID but we try to do as much as we can to have people share a space together the idea being you don't need to share a language to share a space maybe through art through food through other things and so for anyone so, who wants to get involved here's a bunch of ways so Sloan pardon my interruption there but I think you were coming close to uh, so let's say some of the registrants on the passport program wanted to volunteer if volunteering is good, good for the heart, good for the soul, good for your blood pressure, not that you young ones have to think about blood pressure, uh, knock on wood, the, um, could they, I'm just, I'm just making this up. If someone wanted to read a story electronically to some of the young folks, can they do that? Or will they have to get clearances? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say any ideas that people have, the the freedom of being, you know, a newer organization, um, a smaller organization is we can come up with, a, you know, we can sort of definitely like make ideas happen. The downside is also that we're a smaller, tighter organization, but I, I love creative ideas. I can give one quick example. There was a hair salon in Lawrenceville and they reached out and they desperately wanted to give haircuts to refugee women. And they said, you know, we want to, we've tried, no one comes down, we have a room for women who have hijabs so they can be in a private space. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and we have this summer potluck every year where it's postponed this year, but the last three. And I ended up having them come, um, they, they came the, all three of the past years, and the first year was like a chair, the second year was a tent, the third year was like a big tent, and like a, you know, and, um, and this last year they actually shut down for the afternoon, so not just one or two stylists could come, but all of them. So basically so, what you're saying is if the if the passport attendees have an idea they can find you online and they can shoot you your idea and say their idea not for you to do the work but if they have an idea that they can do to see how if it is feasible or not. Is that right? And your email is on, on your website at Hello Neighbor? Exactly, yes. And this slide that you see, so I put my email on here. You can reach out to me. I put the info one and that kind of, you know, we all look at it. Also Perfect. on the website on Hello Neighbor, there's a get involved button in the header. And there's a lot of different ideas that are there. Do a dinner party, do it this, do I mean, there's like a whole section on our get involved. So you can explore that. And at the That's bottom, great. there is a volunteer place to sign up. So basically what Angela and Sloan are saying is if, if you're interested in getting involved in the community, 
there are ways. These are just two wonderful organizations. Uh, I would say uh, be, do it for what, what interests you. Do it to get to know the people that you might. And do it to maybe attend, in the end, even help you find a job. That is something that you can show your initiative. I mean, you all, you know, you're grownups here. You know how all of these things work. Uh, before we open it up for questions, and I was thinking there are lots of acronyms that all it of our families- quiet. I just want to say it did get quiet. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I <laughs> That's it was quiet, right when I went off mute, I'll go back on mute, but it is very quiet now. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> that's, you know, that's life. It's, uh, this is, this is what leading in, in real life looks like you know? Um, and so we have been throwing around lots of acronyms like foundations, and some of you may not even know what foundations are. We can address that in Q&A if you have questions. Uh, Sloan said, shame, Angela, you know, uh, every sector has its own jargon. And then within the nonprofit sector, we have our own jargons. So we can address all of those. But, uh, but before we do that, our third uh, speaker, whom, um, whose mission is just, just fantastic, not that the other two are not, Sustainable Pittsburgh, but I'll let Gina Johnson tell you about their mission. And I'm actually curious about what they have done to pivot in these last few months and what has she done as a leader to pivot so gina with that that's a great question and thank you so much Ravana, and thanks allison i'm uh, so happy to be part of this panel of really uh, amazing passionate women uh with whom we work all all of you all of your organizations are ones that sustainable pittsburgh works with i think uh just uh i'm really kind of uh impressed with the fact that Angela Sloan and I all can tell the same story about being boomerangers who grew up in Pittsburgh and really wanted to be here. But when we were getting out of school, it was harder to do. And I really just want to make the point that you uh, students and young new graduates or soon to be graduates have a wonderful opportunity. Pittsburgh uh, has changed so much that we were all able to come back and um, bring our passion for our hometown. And um, I really do hope a lot of you will stay and get involved with our with the work that we're doing here. I think Pittsburgh gets better all the time because of all of the passion that people have for it. And we do have a huge nonprofit community of people who are working to make it better. I hope that you'll join us. So um, just a few words about Sustainable Pittsburgh. Again, I'm Gina Johnson. Um, Sustainable Pittsburgh has been around for uh, 21 years. We're in our 21st year, advancing sustainability practice and policy in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Our mission is holistic sustainability. So our mission is to empower decision-making that builds fundamentally equitable, resilient, healthy, and a prosperous region. So if you've heard of like the three Ps of sustainability, we're very much a comprehensive sustainability organization. We accomplish uh, this mission and advancing our mission through our work with decision makers at hundreds of organizations and units, municipalities in the region. And that includes nonprofits uh, in, like our, my co panelists and Radna and Allegheny Conference, as well as hundreds of businesses, municipalities, um, any type, type of organization you can think about. So um, we do most of that work through, um, in addition to providing thought leadership and research. We uh, host a suite of performance programs that you can see here to advance sustainability practices at workplaces and communities in this region. And as you can see here, they include the Sustainable Pittsburgh Shop program for uh, Main Street businesses, uh, the Sustainable Pittsburgh Restaurant program for restaurants throughout the region, Sustainable Pittsburgh, uh, I'm sorry, Sustainable Business Compact, which is a framework for organizations to use in adopting and reporting on their sustainable business practices. Uh, for municipalities across the state, we host the Sustainable Pennsylvania Certified Community Program. All of these programs offer kind of um, a, a suite of actions and policies that organizations can take or adopt. And um, by, by um, adopting criteria in areas like diversity, equity, and inclusion, or employee engagement, community engagement, energy, waste, water reduction, waste diversion, that kind of thing, they can earn a designation that uh, tells the world that they have earned silver, gold, platinum, those sorts of designations, and help to communicate that and um, really model that that um, ex that leadership in sustainability. And uh, it really begets uh, sustainability leadership begets sustainability leadership because the first question we often get is, well, like, what what can I do? But when you see that the restaurant that you like to go to. 
um, in your own neighborhood, our shops on your main street are doing this, it's really clear that any organization can adopt these practices. Um, for years, we also hosted the Sustainable Pittsburgh Challenge, which is a really fun, friendly competition uh, involving hundreds of the region's workplaces. And this program is being reinvented with the relaunch expected at the beginning of 2021. Um, over on the right side, you can see that we uh, support the programs who are advancing sustainability through a couple of business networks. Someone is called CEOs for Sustainability, a professional work net network of local business leaders. And we also have one for uh, elected leaders and staff at municipalities across Pennsylvania called the uh, Sustainable Community Development Network, you can see there. And if we go to the next slide, um, some of the, all this work, we love having students who can bring their passion and smarts to advancing our programs. Um, unlike uh, Global Links, we're not really, we weren't designed as a volunteer organization, but we find ways because uh, we find that young people are often bringing uh, a, a new view on the things that we do. And I totally agree with Angela that we need to, we always are looking to, uh, to press ourselves to do better. And, and certainly this crisis has been an opportunity for that. Um, some of the ways that you can get involved, you can see here are volunteering, becoming an intern. Um, with interns, our policy is to engage them as our funding permit, so that can be limiting, but we do sometimes uh, work with unpaid intern interns when the student's able to earn college credit for a specific project at Sustainable Pittsburgh. So some students have done really cool things, like for our restaurant program, some a student created a, a sourcing guide to connect restaurants with like local farms, that type of thing. And our full-time team has been growing, so please consider subscribing to our news e newsletter to see uh, job, job openings as they happen with us. Um, of course, we invite you to check out our website for more information and follow us on social media. Um, and uh, I, I, Rodney, you asked specifically how we've been pivoting uh, as COVID has um, been a crisis for all of the participants that we, we uh, work with. As mentioned, a lot of them are small businesses and restaurants. So a lot of our immediate pivot was uh, providing webinars and getting them connected as much as possible with resources for how to get grants and funding because that was just the on fire pain point. Uh, we worked a little bit with Angela looking at what restaurants are gonna need face masks as they reopen and looking at whether that's a need that we could help uh, fill the gap for with them. Another area, since we do a lot of work in food systems that we've been focusing on um, you know, in the more immediate term here is that we saw the supply chain was really broken with food. As many of you might've seen uh, farmers pouring their milk into the ditch because they couldn't get it to the right uh, channels as restaurants were closed. So we've, we are doing a lot of work in the food systems area to make sure that the restaurants have, a market, have, have customers, that their employees have jobs and are being fed. So one, one project that is a bunch of projects actually is about creating food packs that are made by the restaurants to make sure that they have um, jobs and uh, a market. Also with summer food feeding programs like through uh, the food bank, feeding students, kids who are out of school that need food. So um, creating those connections and then connecting that to, to the local farming community to make sure that they have a market. They can plant stuff, but if there aren't any restaurants to buy it, they're in big trouble. So we're trying to make sure that they have a market as well, connecting all these dots. Um, and and that's we're listening. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, for an intermediary organizations like yours, and especially with the restaurant stuff that you're doing, that's just just amazing. We've got about 10 or so minutes left. So first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Gina, for speeding through everything and you helped us catch up on a couple of the other uh, times. That, uh, and thank you, Angela, and thank you, Sloan. Uh, I'm opening it up for questions. You, there are uh, just a good number of you enough that we can flip back and forth between screens. So if you want to raise your hand or use the uh, raise hand feature on Zoom, whatever you want. And then I think Allison or I can invite you to unmute. And we will uh, begin with there's, and of course you can um, send a question through the chat signal too. There is one question that we already have from Hillary and if Hillary can speak her own question. Say your name, please. And uh, are you interested in a specific industry here? Um, and then into your question, and if you'll make them short, and if the answers can be short, that'll be great. Thanks, Hillary. Hi, so um, I'm Hillary um, Williams Hilton, and I actually am um, affiliated with a nonprofit program called Family and Friends Initiative. 
and we have been providing um, basically resources to families and um, community members who are in need. And I'm specifically um, been focused and concentrated on the youth piece. Um, I actually did uh, coordinate and organize for the Thomas Jefferson High School students, the peaceful demonstration we did in Southland. Um, so I just wanted to know a little bit more. Um, it has been my um, goal to obtain a little more formal introduction to some of the, because really what a lot of things that I do is advocacy. Um, and I have searched it. I have experience in New York City, or not New York City, but upstate New York um, in the Ithaca Youth Bureau where we were. We did receive training under um, the Circle of Courage training. So that was some years ago. And so I was trying to find if there was, I've seen some um, communications here and there about the Circle of Courage in the area. I don't know if that's being utilized in some of the community um, reach for programming, but basically trying to obtain um, something that we I can associate that is going to, um, all, well, you know, some people need to, to hear the, the qualifying um, identi identifying type of uh, um, association with, with who you are and what you're um, attempting, because everyone wants to see evidence-based um, things like that. But right now we're in um, the climate where it is necessary for us to equip our students um, during the summer because there is no summer programming. There's not a lot of summer programming. It's all virtual. Um, a lot of the communities, um, uh, the black communities, um, a lot of people cannot afford to sign up for some of the virtual offerings that are quite expensive. And um, some of the offerings, it's just not accessible. Students, all students can't get online and it's hard if you have more than one student in the household. So um, I guess number one, my, my first question is, how do we obtain that training or certification or um, association with the body that is recognizable in the, from a nonprofit perspective? And then two, um, are, are you actually offering that? Is that offered through, I've seen, I saw the, the youth, um, piece. And so I wanted to know just a little bit more about what you offer with the youth piece. And do you offer training or advocacy or something that we could use when we are going to the school districts to provide them with? Um, so Hillary, let me, let me try to paraphrase. Is this a question to all the panelists or is that the question to Allison? Or is that a question to me? Or is that um, a general question? I don't know who, who would like to take it really. <laughs> okay, so we will, I guess that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, so very quickly, because we've got less than six minutes left to close this out, I will ask you to do the following. Take a look at the website for allies for children and take a look at the website for staying together or what used to be called PACI. And uh, if they should be, if you're looking for something for youth, they are good uh, places sort of like to look at. And after that, if your questions are not being answered, because I'm not very clear about your question, we don't have time to get clarity. I'm happy to stay for a few more minutes uh, on the Zoom link, Allison, to, uh, to try and understand Hillary's question. Um, if Hillary can stay on after 12. Are we able to stay a little bit beyond 12, Allison? Sure, we can. Or Hillary, I just sent my LinkedIn information. I'm happy to connect with you too, and we can just talk through some of the Perfect. organizations that are here locally. So Perfect. happy to follow up. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Hillary, for the question. Appreciate uh, for the for the observation. Thank you. Any other Thank questions? You. Yes, Jake, if you can unmute yourself. You're still mute. Jake, you're still muted. I'm better? Yep. yep, you're here now. So uh, as a chef, I, um, well, I don't know how to begin. This is um, 
directed towards Gina. Uh, she's working with um, with uh, small purveyors of food, small uh, farmers in the area. Pennsylvania is known for, um, I believe she said she's from Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania is known for its, its many small um, small farms um, from here to Lancaster, uh, specifically a little north of Pittsburgh. There's a lot of farms uh, and wineries. But um, I'd like to know, uh, while I've been working personally on and on researching the the laws and regulations that regard who can sell food and what what certifications you need to have to sell food to uh, to a restaurant, or you know, restaurants are really they're only allowed to buy food from from uh, certain purveyors that are registered with the state and with uh, uh, agricultural um, group in the area, and I think there's a lot of untapped potential for people with uh, with small small gardens even in their yard, and I think that there's potential to have these people certified as growers. That I mean, maybe not one person is going to supply um, vegetables and nutrition to a to a to a restaurant, but I think collectively, two, three thousand people in over in Pittsburgh have the potential to um, produce enough produce, things in their garden, uh, to help subsidize farmers or to help subsidize uh, <clears throat> the the restaurants who are having trouble affording this. And especially in times like now, a lot of restaurants are closing because they simply can't afford to continue moving on. So. My specific question is, has Gina looked into at all um, requirements of local growers uh, to be able to sell to, to restaurants? And um, Thank you, Jake. Sorry to interrupt, but I think, Gina, you've got like literally two minutes to answer this question. Uh, and, and again, we can uh, stay back. Do look into Grow Pittsburgh, Jake, if you don't know that organization. But Gina, two minutes. Yeah, well, I am not the food expert at Sustainable Pittsburgh. That would be Rebecca Bykoski. Um, and we work, but we work within, as you can see, the nonprofit industry. It, here in Pittsburgh, we're really lucky in this region to have such a rich. Um, there's someone for everyone, and their chances are right. there are five of everyone. <laughs> so. so there's a group called PASA, which is the Pennsylvania Agricultural Sustainability Association. I believe that that's what it is, PASA. We work with them closely. And then there's the Pennsylvania Restaurant Lodging Association. So these are two organizations we work with a lot who um, might be ones that are good to connect with on that respect. We also uh, are very engaged with the Local Food Policy Council. So these are all organizations, if you're not already involved in, Jake, um, and if, if you're not finding what you need from them, uh, I'd be happy to connect you with Rebecca Bykoski, who can answer more questions. So Jake, maybe the uh, good thing might be, since Gina opened the door, you can send Gina an email uh, and she can connect you with Rebecca. And this is how networking works, good ideas and something good comes out of it. We have just about two minutes and there were no burning questions coming through chat. So Allison, I am obsessed with time always. I'm maniacal about time. Over to you. Thanks very much, Aradna. Um, and thanks everyone for your questions. It was a really robust conversation in person and also on the chat. So feel free to connect with all of us. We provided some links to different resources. Um, Aradna, Gina, Sloan, and Angela, thank you so much for your time and insight. We really appreciate it. Uh, a couple things before we sign off. First, I wanna thank our sponsors again for helping us put the Passport Series on this summer. Peoples, Giant Eagle, Highmark, UPMC Health Plan, EY, Evoqua, PNC, and BNY Mellon. Second, I think coming off of this discussion, many of us are feeling hopeful, we're feeling motivated to make positive change in our communities, and we really need that kind of energy right now more than ever. So I strongly encourage all of you to sign up for the case competition launch on July 6th. Dustin, if you can put the direct link in to sign up, jump on right now, sign up. Um, you don't need to have any experience in case competitions. That might sound like a strange new word or one that you're familiar with. Um, but grab some friends, make some new ones through the passport and work together towards solving a regional challenge. 
So this year we're focusing themes around safe re-entry to college campuses, anti-racism and social justice, and a welcome to Pittsburgh project. Teams can compete for cash prizes, have the opportunity to present ideas to an executive selection committee, and also participate in a private networking event with regional hiring managers. So there's a lot of opportunity there. It's a week's worth of time. It's as much time as you wanna put into it to really get involved, move the region forward. Um, and we're excited to see what you come up with. So until then, look out for our Tech Talk series to kick off next week. Uh, we have an exciting open mic night with all student performers coming up next week as well. So you can check all of that out on www.pittsburghpassport.com. And in the meantime, stay well, be kind, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.